Hello, everyone, and welcome to this PAEA Elementary, Middle, and Secondary Division Collaboration Claim Management 101. Registered participants will receive a Google Form link via email after the event to fill out for their Act 48 credit. We are asking everyone to sign in on the chat roll. Please use the same name in which you registered for this event. Before we begin the webinar, we are asking for participants to mute your microphones during the presentation, but you may keep your video on. Those controls are located in the bottom left corner of the controls bar. We are leaving it up to you to decide on your level of privacy as the recording will be housed on the PAEA website. Many questions were sent in before the event. We will have time for any additional questions you may have in the chat at the end of the presentation. Liza, take it away. Okay, uh, Leah, can you go to the, oh, great, thank you. <laughs> um, sorry, friends, I am having a little bit of technical difficulties. My computer's being very laggy and I was, I ha I should, ha I have my like cord that's supposed to make sure that it is on our home network and for some reason it's not. <laughs> so, um, Thank you for being here um, and a big thank you to all of the people who are, have jumped on board as a part of this panel. Um, I'm not gonna name everybody right now cause I know I'm gonna forget someone. And um, this came about um, really, if anybody came to the elementary division meeting at the last year's conference, uh, there was a, a lot of conversation about how um, art teachers, when we um, go to college, it's more, they like give us some clay and they tell us some things to do with it. And then it magically gets fired. Um, and, and then when you first have your own classroom, you're not sure what to do. And you have to learn a lot on your own. Um, we have, we have tons of slides here and this is, I think this has become more a bigger beast than any of us Im could have imagined. <laughs> and so we are going to like try and plow through our slides and um, there's going to be a lot on them that we kind of skip over because there's no way we can get through it all in this time but we will be sharing the slideshow with you so that you will be able to read through it. And we also um, are adding a slide of all of our contact information so that you can get in touch with us. But my biggest thing um, that I would say about clay at the elementary level is, well, aren't we lucky that it's elementary and things definitely don't have to be perfect. <laughs> And um, it is great to learn as much as we can about this whole process, but um, whenever we're presenting it to our students, like anything else, we're presenting it at a more simplified um, level than um, our middle school and high school people. Uh, so you can read through the rest of that uh, if you want later, but, but I'm going to pass it on to Holly now. Hi, hey everyone. So what I try to do with middle school is I try to make it a little bit inclusive, a lot inclusive for all of the students, because as we all know, we have some students that have no interest in being there and other students who it is their favorite class of the day. So what I do is I really try to pique their interest and I try to tie it into kind of what's going in their lives. So when I started out, I start out with that funny little picture that you see up the top with um, the rock and a rock and then the clay. And I try to um, mix in a lot of the science when I do clay for middle school, because I feel that way I bring everybody into the fold. I have the kids who are uh, feel they're not that creative and it's not their thing and maybe more of the STEM classes are their thing. But then we have the kids who are super creative and don't really see the STEM tying in with them. I try to bring them all into the fold and tie them all together. So what I do is throughout the unit, I talk about how, um, you know, I make it a little funny with the rock, but I really do speak to them about um, climate and erosion and clay is really made up of feldspar and how feldspar is 50% of the earth's surface. 
so that I'm getting a little bit of everybody in. It doesn't matter if they remember this or not. I'm just trying to get everybody's attention at what's happening. So we're trying to find that nice little balance between the experimentation and the simplifying the process because we're starting to get technical here, but we're not as technical as high school gets. So the idea is to just keep everybody on board and find something that everybody can kind of grab onto. So I kind of focus on the foundation of the techniques. I make sure they understand and um, really can roll out their own clay at this point. So we get the old thing out where we get a pencil and everybody tries to roll with the pencil. I do goofy things like not only explain the erosion process, but like I'll wear like lobster hands when I'm teaching them how to hold it and flip it over when they roll so they don't get their fingers in it. Again, trying to keep everybody on board. Um, I really emphasize smoothing so that when they do their glazes, they don't have the rough edges and very simple attachments. I don't go crazy with handles and things like that, but we do put like little feet on sometimes or if they're doing like a side box, like how to put just, you know, one or two attachments on it for different textures, that's it. The science is really gentle, but again, it's meant to bring everybody kind of into the fold. Um, I really like to explain the processes with them. So after this generation, as we know, wants everything like super quick and they want instantaneous, like why isn't this done? So it's important to me to explain to them like with the best process, like um, again, bringing everybody into the fold. After they make it, they don't understand like, oh, well, why can't it go like right in the kiln right now? Like what is happening? So I explained to them like what happens, you know, there's water, you know, mixed in with the clay and what happens at 212 degrees. So, you know, they think back at their science and they are with science in seventh and eighth grade. This is where they're at. They're at the water cycle. They're at um, very entry level thermodynamics. So they get all of this stuff. So after we talk about that, then I talk about how they should know when it's ready for it to go in the kiln because they can feel it. And they're always like super interested. Though. Why is it cold? So I tell them to put it up to their face and feel if it's still cold. Well, then it's not ready for us to fire yet. So of course, then some of them want to know why. So that's when I get kind of like the evaporative cooling. I go over that and how for the water to evaporate, it's a process that takes energy. And for it to have energy, it takes the heat from the rest of the clay. So you again, you're bringing everybody into the fold with this as to why it's happening and why it's important. So we talk about like that bisque stage, they have to be able to fire it once without the glazes on it so that they can hold it so that they have like a smooth edges. So we do all about that. When I talk to them about, you know, how, you know, the feldspar and the silica and all that, that makes it up. It's important that they understand like there's organic material that's in that clay and it has to burn out. So we talk about the different um, heating stages at the, in the kiln, a little bit about the thermodynamics. I actually let them see it once I have it filled so that they can see, you know, the taller things are in the middle. And I ask them why would that happen? Smaller things on the outside. So it's kind of fun. We talk about the clay fuses together. I explain to them what happens when things um, don't work out right. I have a little picture in the corner. I can't see it, but I think you guys can see it where you have your little piece started. And then what happens if you get it started too early? Well, then it explodes in the kiln. You can see that down there on the right hand side. And they always kind of think that's like interesting. I want them to understand that it's fun and I don't get into too much of the technical nature of it. Listen, if things don't work out, I've had kids where after it's made and after we have it glazed, and if it really turns out horrible, we have like a little smash party and then I actually let them smash it sometimes. And then we go and talk about how like destruction is creation and just try to tie everything together, make it fun and bring everybody into the fold. So that's how I handle clay in middle school. I hope that helped you guys in any way, shape or form. Um, I'm Jessica, uh, Jessica Kirker. I teach at Norristown High School. Um, those are my beautiful little darlings up there with their mugs on graduation day. Um, so just some things about um, high school as, as it differs from, from middle school and um, elementary school, but also keeping it general, you know, because everybody has different types of programs in high school. You might like, you know, like Jill and I, we only teach ceramics all day, every day where other schools, you know, you may do one or two projects with high school or have one ceramics class. Um, so there's a whole spectrum of what happens in high school. So just like elementary, you know, we, we cover the gamut here. Um, one thing that I started during COVID um, and I didn't mean to, 
um, is really going over the technicals at the beginning of the class. Um, I did it out of necessity because we didn't have clay the first year when we came back when we were fully virtual. Oh my gosh, what are we going to do? I always had this like jump in and get our hands on it right away. That was always my thing because like to Holly's point, it's very inclusive. Something happens in middle school with children where everybody in elementary school thinks they're a great artist and somewhere around middle school they get very self-conscious about their art um, and then by high school everybody oh I can't draw a stick figure. Um, clay is the place where it doesn't matter if you can draw a stick figure no one's going to ask you to draw a stick figure and that whole urgency to feel um, realistic drawing as being you know the pinnacle of great art kind of goes away in high school and, and they can create and it's a brand new medium almost for everybody especially to the level that they're going to do it in high school you know they might be doing sample projects you have keys, babe. I'm sorry I'm so sorry I, I got here late I apologize okay um Sorry. Um, so they might have done a few projects along the way, but this might be their opportunity to like really find that this is their medium and own that art form. Um, so back to what I was saying about, you know, going over the technical aspects, this was a COVID thing where we didn't have clay at the beginning. And so instead of jumping in, we took a lot of time to learn like the language of clay. We need, we learned the difference between earthenware and stoneware and why porcelain is different and what they're all used for. And we really dug into the differences between a Raku firing versus a wood firing. And we did a lot of research. And I, you know, kept apologizing, sorry, we don't have clay, sorry, we don't have clay. But then when we were done doing it that way, I wound up with the greatest group of students from a technical aspect. They understood things far better than any of my previous students did. They spoke the language of clay better. Um, they made better choices um, about their clay and about what they wanted to do. They came in with so much more knowledge. So that has been um, something that I have stuck with since COVID and it has had wonderful results for me. We're really spending a lot of time um, going over clay bodies they just feel more competent going into it as a result of me doing that. So it's not how I would have originally structured my class, but it's had wonderful results. That would be a little tip from me. Um, but the next two points, actually, you could actually uh, go to the next slide for this um, one, Leah, because I have pictures to go with. So advocating for your program. I'm always one that's really big for advocating for your program because painting is never gonna burn down your school and drawing is very cheap. And so I always feel like, you know, why did we just spend $2,000 repairing the kiln? You know, there's always like that, um, you know, extra hurdle, I think what, what comes with clay because there is that kind of that, the big cost that comes with it. And so it takes up a lot of your facilities. You have to have your kiln, you have to have your vent. And you know, every time there's a fire alarm, you know, you get a little nervous and stuff like that. So um, you don't have that with other art classes. So I constantly feel the need to advocate for my program and why this tactile medium is so important. Um, so bringing the outside in and spreading the mud as we call it um, in our school is something that has been really beneficial for our program. As I said in the previous slide, which you don't have to flip back to, but I think everybody is clay curious. Everybody like, especially old people have seen ghosts and they think it's so cool and they want to do it. Now, of course, the young kids don't know, but the teachers do. And the teachers are the ones that you really need on your side and the admin as well. That one picture there is our superintendent of schools learning how to throw under the guidance of a student. So what we do is we have a spread the mud event where you bring somebody in, an administrator, a teacher, or a friend, you get different points. You know, if you bring a friend in, you get five points. You bring a teacher in, you get 10 points. You bring an administrator in, you get 15 points if you can teach them how to throw something correctly on the wheel. So a lot of people come into the class and this is the best. I love coming. I love when you do this. I love when you offer this. Um, and it gets people to be really aware of what's going on um, and exposed to your program and enjoy your program and have good thoughts when, when it comes to your program. You know, with clay, it doesn't display on the wall. You know, admin likes to have things. Um, oh, thank you. Admin loves to have things to display. And, and you know, we're, we don't do any of the poster contests. Sorry, can't do your poster contest. So I constantly constantly feel like the need to show my work in other ways. They're not always going to give me those expensive display cases. So I need to make sure I'm visible in other ways. And this spread the mud event um, has been like really good. and People really look forward to it. The other thing I like to do is take my students out. So the other picture on the right is us 
um, at Chofuso Tea Garden. You can see they really love their first taste of matcha tea, um, but we try to find other ways that, you know, clay is used in our lives and in our communities um, and going to shows like this. So um, that's it for me for high school and until my next slide. All right, hello, my name is Crystal. I uh, taught elementary art for 11 years and this is my second year teaching high school art and I'm going over safety because I got really sick last year. So I taught um, kindergarten through fifth grade clay and had no problems. And then I taught high school art um, with another teacher. So we shared all curriculums and the room was always a mess with a lot of um, dry clay all over it. And so I got really sick. So I did a lot of research. So general safety, good studio practices are the best way to reduce the amount of dust in your room. So basically I, and I cringe always like when I go on Instagram and I see like somebody who has a wheel and they do it full time and they're like, oh, it's time to clean the wheel. I haven't cleaned it in two weeks. I'm like, no, no, that's so bad for you. Clean your equipment, your tools and your surfaces before the clay dries. Obviously we always have that time where it is going to dry. So um, just wet your surfaces with water and then a damp sponge. I also use um, like a, just a scraper to scrape the tables and then also clean your clothes. I know I was in a bad habit of like putting it in the corner and let it sit till Saturday. I'm trying to like move my clothes into the wash more often than just waiting till the weekend. Um, so for dust management, I have the students clean the whole table with a damp sponge. Then they scrape the table with a scraper and use the micro fiber cloths to dry. And I've had little to no clay dust this year, which has been really great. Um, so hi, I'm Leah Shuck. I'm uh, one of the region one representatives. I just added a little uh, snippet in here. Um, during COVID, we actually moved from sponges to microfiber rags so that they could be washed and sanitized regularly. And since having done that, I've noticed significantly less dust in the room because the rags can be more thoroughly rinsed and washed um, more frequently, whereas sponges, you can only rinse them. So that is something we have stuck with since the switch from COVID. Okay, so basically what we're trying to avoid is silicosis. So this is very long, but basically silica dust is inhaled deeply into your lungs when it is dry. So that dried up clay that's left on the table that's scraped or when students are like clapping their hands, I usually just try and tell them like, don't do that, it's not good for you. Um, obviously you need to inhale a lot to get really sick, but I'm, I did go over this with my high school students just to kind of put the little fear in them to help keep me keep it clean, um, especially because I don't want to get sick again. So um, it's not reassuring to hear about silicosis, but just keeping your space really clean will keep the exposure to such a low level that you wouldn't have to worry about it. So with cleaning, there's little or no increase to the air quality, which is great. Um, trimming and sanding, I I'm trying to retrain my students who had a teacher that loved to sand. Students were sanding fired, bis fired projects. And I was like, that is not, that is not safe. You're not wearing a mask. What are you doing? They're like, oh, we did this at home. It was fine. I'm like, it's really not fine. Producing dust is really bad for you to breathe in. So I'm just trying to teach them to do all of your ribbing and smoothing before you fire your piece. Um, obviously you trim before it's dry is much safer. Yes, no sanding your work. Um, so with clay, this actually started with uh, COVID too. Um, so I had my students, we were virtual right away. So I was like, what are we gonna do? Uh, stages of clay. So I had them research the stages of clay and they had to design a one page spread of all of the stages, but using visual notes. So um, I went to NAEA this past year and watched a visual, visual note presentation and also um, Art of Ed had one last summer too, and I loved it so much. And I really love how every student turns out really different and like kind of their own. And it's just a great way for them to remember the stages um, before you even get started with clay for older students. Hi, those are great, those posters, by the way. And this is just something I found when I was doing a little look around on the web of a nice poster that is the stages of clay with pictures. And it shows you slip, plastic, leather, hard, bone dry, bisqueware, glazeware. And it's nice if you look on the right-hand side, it tells you which part is non-recyclable, recyclable, and which part you can still recycle. So I thought that was cool. 
Becky, I love that graphic. I might steal that. Um, and then my next step to do that after we go over the stages of clay is we go over the types of clay. And um, like I said, I, I have them make more informed choices. Now this is more for my Ceramics 2 students where they get to choose their clay a little bit more, but they, they research what the purpose of each clay is, what the pros and cons of each stage of clay is. And we do this before you know we really get into um, digging deep into the clay, but they feel really empowered and they feel really excited about trying those new types of clay because of, of going over this in the beginning of the, the year. So um, we wanted to share a little bit about what kind of clay we use and why. Um, so I am over here on the Western side of the state. So we use uh, standard ceramic clay. They're located in Carnegie, Pennsylvania, which is actually where I live. So I can walk there, which is cool. Um, they aren't a big chain. So I also oh, like- I guess that's not gonna happen at the moment. Yeah. If you want to call back Could you mute, please? Okay, we can do that. How was your trip lunch? Oh, I can't talk. Okay, thanks. So um, I like to use standard ceramic only, uh, not only because they're local, but also because they're uh, a small business. So whenever I need help with something, I know that if I call, I'm always going to be able to talk to a real person who I've actually met in the shop. Um, and they're going to be able to walk me through whatever I'm experiencing. Um, and they also have technicians, they have all their own glazes. Um, and you can also schedule tours that you can go and see how their clay and glazes are made right there on the premises. Okay, um, I just um, threw this in uh, to the sh uh, slideshow uh, to show I get the basic low fire clay. Um, my school district has um, a contract with school specialty and um, honestly, I haven't even looked that often at what other clay I can order through them because I know that the uh, basic white low fire is what I get um, mostly. I, I have um, gotten some of their red clay um, in the past. Um, and I think um, passing it on to Leah. Is that? Nope, that was my slide. Um, actually, I use that clay too. Um, oh. Okay. So, and I also have the, the contract with school specialty where we have to buy most of our stuff there, but they let me buy a lot of my clay from the ceramic shop because it's in Norristown and I'm in Norristown. So that's not much of a problem. Now, as I told everybody, I let people research the types of clay and that's a blessing and a curse because then it makes my students really ambitious about which clays they want me to buy. Um, what I want to convey with this slide is to not be afraid to try new bodies of clay. Um, I often will just, you know, find like, I just found out black porcelain. I can find a mid fire black porcelain. You know, I'm going to buy a hundred pounds of that for next year. So we can try it out and see if we love it. Um, and you know, clay is not super expensive. So if you want to try something out and you just buy a hundred pounds of it and you give a couple pounds to each of your advanced kids and say, what do y'all think of this? You know, we've gone through terracotta and we love it or we don't. Or so what I have here is I have that same white clay when we just do a little one day draping project um, with that low fire or white clay and and we do use it sometimes when we want those vibrant colors that we're not going to get with a mid-fire clay we also do the red the brooklyn red and my students love the brooklyn red it's nice for throwing it's smooth but let me tell you it stains everything and if you have white clay and you have that brooklyn red clay you're going to love that brooklyn red clay but it's going to make some pink clay um so it's really hard to keep them separate as much as my students love it i'm very like strict about when we pull out the red clay Next to the Brooklyn Red, there's a bisque fire piece in the back and a glazed fire piece in the front. And then right next to that, I had one student that wanted to make pieces out of every type of clay to experiment which, with which they liked the best, which I think is great. Um, the next one was a high fire white, which same thing. I just bought a, you know, 150 pounds of it. Everybody try it. Let's see if we like it, if we're going to put it on the docket. The most commonly used clay that we use at the high school 
is a brown speckle stoneware. And that's what I have in the back with the face mug. That's the brown speckle stoneware fired with a clear glaze. So that's what it looks like. And then the bell that I have over there on the other side of the screen um, is what it looks like unfired. We love the natural qualities to it. It's a good glaze for throwing. It's nice and sturdy. It's very easy to rehydrate. Um, so it's a really good all-purpose clay and it's where they start with. My Ceramics 2 students are allowed to use that mid-fire porcelain um, that I hoard very carefully and everybody wants to use it until they use it and then they find out how hard it is to actually throw with porcelain um, and they get so excited about doing it and then they curse it within like two days. Um, but it's a cool experience to make them try it and for a hundred pounds of that porcelain it's worth it to me. But what I want to, like I said, what I want to convey here is that, you know, it you can try multiple clay bodies, you know, stick with your, your standard. My standard is gonna be that, that brown speckle stoneware with a little bit of white clay um, and occasionally buying that, that red clay too. But I'm gonna go find different clay bodies and I'm gonna keep experimenting and then let my students give me feedback on what they like. So I'm just going to talk a little bit about clay um, storage. A lot of um, companies sell these bins on wheels with lids. And um, I had one at the previous school I worked at. But at the current school I work at, we sort of built the ceramics program from the ground up. Um, and this just wasn't something that we wanted to spend our money on. Um, it seemed like a silly thing to spend hundreds of dollars on. So we actually just use the Brute trash cans for our clay storage for uh, recycling as well as for good clay. Um, but I did just want to mention that in the good clay bin, we do still keep the clay in plastic bags so that it's sealed tightly. Um, so as far as distributing clay to students goes, everybody has their own routine. Um, for me at the high school level, when we have tried in the past to have students be responsible for their own clay storage in their cupboard, um, we found that they just forget to rehydrate it and it ends up needing to be recycled and takes up all the space in their cupboard. Um, so as long as you're in a situation where you have you know, an excess of clay that you're not trying to, you know, keep and recycle and, you know, have every scrap that you're using all the time available. Um, I would just say to have the kids keep the clay in the clay bins rather than in their own specific cupboards or cubbies, whatever you have going on, because um, it just saves you less work recycling in the end. Okay, um, I added this slide. Um, it just shows, um, I, I like to have something for the students to um, work on top of so the clay isn't sticking to the table um, and it helps with cleanup. And these are uh, the, the little pieces of fabric that you see are, um, they're actually torn out of in when I first started teaching in state college, I was teaching in this old trailer that had stuff just for that. I, I don't know. <laughs> People had been hoarding things in that trailer for years. And there were these um, books of like fabric samples. And so I cut um, these like rectangles of fabric out and they're kind of thicker fabric, almost like canvas. And that works really well. I like to use um, either plates or like pie tins for um, the tools so that the students can easily see what tools are out in the middle of the table and easily grab them because um, elementary teachers know that our class period, especially with something like clay goes by so fast and we like to get done what you want to to get on in a class period um, is crazy. I also have these little tiny um, containers that um, I just put for water that I just put in between. I don't use slip, we score. Um, I give the kids a whole uh, talk about um, how um, scoring, it, you can kind of, if this is a piece of clay, you can kind of think about uh, the it being the lines that you draw into the clay and you do that on both pieces and then put a little bit on of water on each piece and then jiggle them together and that's the glue that holds them together. Um, unlike if you take two pieces of clay 
without those scores, um, they can easily come apart if it's just two smooth surfaces. So um, I feel like that visual kind of helps them to like remember better the, the importance of scoring. Um, and now we have, um, I'm sorry, I'm not sure of your, is it Kathy? Kathy. Okay, um, Kathy. thank you for being here. Thank you. Are you ready for me? Yes, yep. Okay, well, my name is Kathy Skaggs. I taught art K-12 in the Florida public school system for over 30 years. I was teaching drawing and painting in the secondary in a, a high school, junior middle school, high school. They came in and said, well, you have to do something 3D. I'm like, well, Clay, that looks pretty good. I think I'll do that. Didn't have a clue. Told the kids we were gonna learn on the job. And we did. And then I ended up teaching. I ended up going back to school to get my MFA from University of Florida in ceramics. While I also got my master's in art edge from RISD because I wanted to both be in the studio and be active as an educator. When I started with Amico, I realized nobody had been in the K-12 classroom and it is a totally different beast. And so um, when I, after I left teaching and came back, I taught all clay high school up to AP and IB. So I was pottery one through AP IB. I'm so glad you guys went first. I think you're doing an amazing job. It is difficult at best to wrap your head around at first. It's the logistics that will really get to you. I'm gonna share with you today the uh, curriculum that I used in the classroom that I wrote for Amico and they have free on the site. You can download it, you can modify it. It has everything from presentations to paperwork. I had did a lot of documentation. I had kids keep sketchbooks before and after projects. Um, because I also wanted to have a paper trail so that parents, when they came in for a parent conference, didn't think they were just squeezing mud and making trinkets. So that was kind of my goal as an art educator. When I get done, or Holly can share it with you, my email address is clayopatra at gmail. So if you think of anything that I didn't cover, or you wanna ask me anything, anything from mixing glazes to adapting glazes, I'm all about clay in the classroom. So I'm gonna show you some things that I've put on the Amico site. Uh, currently, I'm a studio artist here in North Florida. So I'm lucky that I'm not teaching now, but I'm in my studio constantly, either coming up with ideas for uh, Amico, or and working on my own work. So I love all kinds of education questions, I gotta tell you. So let me switch over to my screen and let me show you some things that I want to share with you. You cannot start screen share while other participants are sharing, it says. Okay. Yep, you should be good to go now. Okay. All right, so this first one is just the regular Amico site. I'm gonna move some things around here because I have a multiple screens open because I didn't know, you know, you always don't know how it'll go. So if you scroll down to the Amico website, there's a couple of things. One is this YouTube link. If you go to this YouTube link, there are a lot of things on there, a lot of, um, different things that you can put on. These are a lot of lesson plans that I put on this Matisse underglaze, these little dishes, things like that. But if you go in here and type um, like recycle, I just want to show you this one. This really goes to a video of how I recycled in the classroom. I never use buckets. I um, And it tells you how to recycle from right after kids do a project to if your clay's a little stiffer, to you inherited a, a classroom where the clay is rock hard. So this that video will go through it. And I have a lot of other ones, printmaking and these other demo ones on there. So there's a lot on the Amico Brent website. If you go to um, 
Let me just switch back over here. Okay, if you scroll down on the Amico site, because this is a little tricky to find, it's a separate address. If you go right here, this is Amico Classroom. So if you go there, it will bring you to uh, a site that has all the educational stuff. And included in that is the curriculum that I wrote for them that I loaded. And that's basically how I, how I taught ceramics when I did it. So if you scroll down, it's right under here under curriculum. And if you go to learn more, it has ceramics one, ceramics two, some templates you can download. The difference between ceramics one and ceramics two is ceramics one is getting everybody to know the terms, to know um, the basics. Everybody's work looks different, but it's all kind of similar because I might have a 12th grade advanced student sitting by a ninth grade ESE student and I had to make it all work. So ceramics one was all getting them reeled in to love it and be successful. And ceramics two is all about kicking them back out of the nest. So I got them in the nest, made them feel very secure and then bam, popped them back out. Within this curriculum, so if you go here, this is just the basics, pinch, coil and slab because I found that once they could do those, they could build anything up through AP. So once they had that good foundation, if you go into ceramics one, let's say, and you go into the coil pots, within here are, there's a keynote presentation I'm gonna show you or PowerPoint. It is a step-by-step. -step. This is basically how I taught students to do clay in the classroom. I filmed everything. I never did a live demonstration because I found that high schoolers didn't come to school every day. And I also found that they needed to repeat or find the information. So I'm gonna show you what those look like. I found it to be very powerful. And I found that I really didn't leave any kids behind. There's lesson plans, historical references. So I'll show you kind of what they look like, but you can, it's one of those things you have to get in and knock around. It's all free, you download it, you change it. So there's forms like within that for the coil and the pinch and the slab, each has a lesson plan. Again, I would modify it, but I tried using different terminology for each project. There is a history of coil pots. This is like, I didn't teach anything from Ceramics Monthly because I wanted them to know where those people in Ceramics Monthly got their some of their ideas and it's right there in the history and it's something I didn't really have a chance to do uh, these things on historical pottery so I put it in there for you I find it very helpful for research for them I put a pacing guide this is what I found I was never good about repeating myself year after year I always wanted to do something new and different but I did find there were certain things as the kids progressed that were very common there is this one. This is what I call a cheat sheet. This goes with the keynote or PowerPoint presentation. It's basically notes from me to you. Some of you will know there's no audio. You are the audio, but some people know everything about clay. Some people do not, and they're kind of intimidated by it. So you can pick and choose vocab. There's three vocabs in there. They're all different and they all have this, whoa, cute vocab test. And this, so I made them do vocab. Uh, there's one set in pinch, one set in coil, and one set in slab. None in the pottery too, because you're kind of on to some other things. So let me uh, screen share one other thing. Okay. So this is what my pre this is what I did when I taught everything. Well, I taught all play mainly at the end. But I put everything in move embedded movies into Keynote and PowerPoint. And this is what I found out. If you show a kid how to build a quill pot from a YouTube video, it gives them this much information. And by the time they get to the end, they're like, oh, Miss Skaggs, where do I go to start? So what I did is I broke everything down into steps in a Keynote. In their head, it broke it down into steps. I only showed them the steps I wanted them to do for that day. So they had an overall goal. I'd already gone over that. But when they came in here 
And these are all you can download PowerPoint and Keynote and you can change them or delete what you want, but they all have movies in them. And I found that the kids were mesmerized by this. I mean, I had no talking. I mean, they were right in it. I was talking to them while the movies were going on. The notes at the bottom are notes to you. If you don't know how to teach clay or you need a little help, that'll help you. If you uh, already know, you don't even need the notes. You might insert more slides of yours. You might use some slides or delete some slides. But basically this goes over you know, exactly what I wanted them to do. And I had it, They. this is what I found. I found a lot of kids that were AP students that I wanted in my program would come to me and go, Miss Skaggs, I really want to take a studio class. In Florida, they all have to anyway. But I really want to take it, but I'm really worried about my grade point. I said, if you come to me, I'm going to tell you what the criteria is on a grading rubric before you start on that project. And if you want a, a grade, it's like a checklist. Do these things. Those kids came in at Pottery One and they never left because they really could see a vision of how to, to do that. But the ceramics one is all the basics, but in ceramics two, say, the difference is this. In ceramics one, everybody makes the same slab pot out of these index cards. And then I had to make a sculpture on the top so they wouldn't look identical. But in pottery two, they have to make everything but a 90 degree angle. And they all had to make paper forms, tag board forms, so they could see it in the round. Kids that work in clay, they, they, if they wanted to draw, they'd be in a drawing class. So for them to draw things like that is difficult. So I may, had to make three-dimensional templates out of tag board. That way, when they rolled their slabs, they were ready to cut it up and ready to assemble their piece. And they had they knew where they were going. There's a lot of information in there. And believe me, I could go on and on and on and on about this. Let me unshare. Let's see if I can get rid of that. I am all about clay in the classroom, 150%. If you need anything from me, I, I am, will help you get started any way you, I can, because if you can wrap your head around recycling, if you can wrap your head around the projects, if you can wrap your head around firing without things exploding, life is gonna be good for you. And that's it. <laughs> I'm done. Hello. I'm going to jump in. Thank you, Kathy. Yay. That was awesome. You're I just welcome. heard in the chat what an amazing presentation that. that was. And I'm glad that's online and accessible. Super cool. Thank you. And one one last quick thing. I'm going to be at NAEA and in SICA. So okay. if you go to either one of those, Come by the Amico booth and see me. That's it. <laughs> I'm just going to stay unmuted and I'm also going to do a second slide introduction. Um, I am Becky Hughes. I'm the Region 12 rep for PAEA. And um, in a former life, I, I went to University of the Arts for ceramics. So I am actually trained in ceramics as, as a teacher, uh, which is like an odd bird I learned these days. I also taught for Claymobile for 12 years when I got out of college. And a lot of what I like to do kind of stems from that kind of learning. Claymobile is an outreach program through the Clay Studio, and it takes clay in a van to various organizations all over the city and surrounding areas. So I'm at the bottom of suggestions for must-have tools, and I'm just going to read the bold about what tools I really think are important to bring into the classroom when you're making something. And not everybody likes my very first one, which is toothpicks, but that's what I like to use as pencils for clay. Um, I think the wooden, green, or plastic modeling tools are important. Wire clay cutters, you should probably have two in case one breaks, because I certainly have had that happen in the classroom before where I'm wire toolless and uh, cannot you know, wire play cutter less. I think we one time ripped string off of the side of a canvas table covering to try and cut clay because we were desperate. Um, the yellow round throwing sponges, I love those. And you can buy them in big packs. Um, 
knives and brushes. We have this listed many other places. You can read at your my you know your leisure later at the slides at the rest of this. Um, but there's a lot of why and how and wherefore and uh, what my suggestions are. I'm going to mute. Okay, this is my slide, um, things that you really don't need because if you're on a budget or if you're just starting out with clay and you don't wanna put the investment into clay tools because they can actually add up. Um, I've broken a lot of, uh, maybe more than most people. I, I thought everybody went through those wire tools as often as I did, but maybe not. I go through a lot of those. And so I've actually found that like a heavy duty, a heavy test fishing line works really good. Sometimes we wrap them around little blocks and we just make our own. Um, because I break them a lot. Um, so thinking of COVID again, we were, uh, we were at home for like a full year and I couldn't send home pin tools to everybody, but we may do with a lot of stuff that after the fact, I was like, you know, that actually works better than what I've been buying. So slab rollers, like I would love to have a slab roller, but I just don't even have the, the real estate for a slab roller in my classroom. So we use um, slab sticks. If you're not familiar with those arts, instead of having a, a roller that gets you the right thickness of your slab is that you have a stick that's an equal thickness. Leah had said that she tapes together um, yard sticks. We've gotten like trim from Home Depot and use those as slab sticks because you can buy slab sticks. They're like bamboo and they're really nice, but they're expensive. Um, so so we kind of like find our own thickness of things of, of pieces of trim from the hardware store and we use that and as long as that rolling pin I always tell the kids if you can hear wood on wood then your slab is the right thickness but if you're not hearing wood on wood then you got to keep rolling that uh, slab out so that you're getting that nice even thickness so that's been a really good one it saves money and it saves space as well um pin tools you know I don't like pin tools all that much in a high school I just feel like they can disappear but I found that paper clips work really well. Like um, like Becky said, toothpicks and tacks have been really good for like the nice detail work. So we still have them, but I also have other options because I don't like to buy a whole lot of pin tools. This is one that's like my, my new thing is I'm never buying rib tools anymore. Um, I don't know if anybody else ever tried this, but school IDs, like we get those extra ID cards, they make the best rib tools. They're just kind of flexible. Um, and they're much cheaper. Rib tools are actually kind of expensive for what you get. It's like a piece of plastic. Um, but like old hotel cards, like those like, you know, key cards from hotels, they're great for rib tools. And then the popsicle stick for the, the modeling tools and Scrafito, the coolest Scrafito tool I've ever found. And now it's gonna be my new go-to, bobby pins. The round end of a bobby pin is so nice for carving. And if you've ever done Scrafito, if you've done Scrafito with a bobby pin, you're never going to go back. It's so nice. It's so even with the marks it makes. Um, and then plastic utensils for everything because I mean, you can really score great with a plastic fork and a knife. I'm up again. Um, these are more helpful extras and I know we're getting kind of shorter on time. So I hope you guys can take a look at suggestions for using Canvas. Um, one thing that I learned from a potter friend years ago was building on drywall, which is really nice. You can cut it to fit whatever size you need. And it's kind of cool because it absorbs moisture while you're building on it. So that's kind of nice. You don't end up having clay ever stick to it, but you do have to be aware of it drying out quickly. It's a great way to use, um, dry tiles and keep them flat. Um, and blue plastic tarps were always my favorite for underglaze and glaze. Um, I just feel like it kind of contains the mess and you slop around on there and then you can roll them up and then put them back out as needed. And that's it. Um, so I just added in a quick slide that you all can take a look at later at your convenience. Um, there has been a lot of talk lately about canvas controversy. Should we or should we not? I know that we're trying to move away from canvas in the classroom just because of um, the dangers of silicosis, which were shared with us earlier. I know a lot of teachers are moving to hardy backer board or tar paper for their wear boards. Um, so I dropped a link here in the um, presentation that'll be shared with you. It's a real quick video. You could even speed up um, the play and learn a little bit about the different options for, for work surfaces and wear boards. Can I, can I jump in real quick on that? Um, can you hear me? Uh, okay, real quick. 
uh, Amazon, they have a product called Craft Text. It's spelled K-R-A-F-T-E-X. It looks like a heavy fiber, but it is actually fabric. And I use it in my slab roller. I don't use any canvas anymore because it harbors. I'll put it in the chat. It comes in a bolt. It looks like like a heavy cardboard, but it's actually fabric. You can hose it off, you can wash it. It works great. Thank you, Kathy. Um, I'll go with, I did not add um, the top part about slip. Uh, it says get a cheap mixer, mix bone dry clay with water to have instant slip. Yes, just crush up clay and add water and you have slip. Um, I also just wanted to point out everybody's situation is unique, but if you do have a lot of dry clay, not a lot of dry clay, um, but uh, you know, you're generating dry clay. I kind of do look like that at that as trash in the classroom that I do throw out and try not to feel too guilty about it because I'm not going through a ton of clay. I'm going through like a small amount of clay and the, the time it takes for me to recycle, I have, I've come to do that. So I was just admitting that there. I'm done. Okay. Um, I threw in the next slide about um, how I store wet work in my classroom. And I added this link and I, I, I worded it um, for this way for a reason. I mostly love these baskets. I will say the, the, bot the bottom of the baskets has like, it's a little bit raised and has some give to it. And so sometimes I wish that the bottom would just of these baskets stayed more flat, <laughs> but um, I really do like them for, um, I have a, I use a basket per table and I label the edge of the basket with the table color. And then I have um, the students from that table. And sometimes if I can fit in a couple other pieces from a, a table next to it, um, I'll consolidate. And, um, and then we put them in, we put a couple of paper, wet paper towels on top. And then I put the whole bag in a garbage bag and I have those binder clips. And what I really love about these is that the handles fold over so that you can um, stack them. And so if I need to store them, I, I can store them stacked like three high and store them for a week. I only usually do that with like third, fourth and fifth grade um, because I really try in kindergarten first and second um, to have projects that we can get done in one class period because storage is a pain. <laughs> um, and oh, and I have the next slide too. <laughs> um, the next slide is, oh, about putting names on. We had a number of questions about uh, the best way to get names on elementary projects. And I have tried many things and I wish I had a brilliant solution, but I really, um, with, definitely with third, fourth, and third, fourth, and fifth, I let them do it. They do their initials, they do their class code. Um, and then I also have them, well, I just started including this a couple years ago. I have them because I have my tables labeled by um, colors. So I have them um, also add the first letter of their table color. <laughs> Um, just to, it helps me when I, whenever I'm firing things and have so many things, um, sometimes I have to use any little bit I can have on there to help me decipher uh, whose student, um, whose, whose work it is. And we'll go ahead to the next one. Um, so I, oh, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Lee. Um, Liza, can I jump in there really quick? Just one sure. random suggestion with tagging work. We used to, for Claymobile, you would actually just make a little tile 
that said the kid's name or the class they were in, and you could just drop it in the pot because it could get fired. Now it doesn't work for glazing, but it helped when you were loading the bisque up a whole lot. So I'm a little sorry. clay can... name tag is one other a tile. Yeah, it would just be a little tiny bit of clay that you'd have like either the kid or the class's name written on. So when you're like really loading up a kiln, you could like throw the tile into the like if it was a bowl, you could throw it inside. So you kind of could like ungroup things while you're firing and find that they could find their way back later. I don't know. Somebody okay, might so find you that put helpful. one with every piece. Um, I think sometimes we did, or if it was like an area, you would have like, you know, you kind of tag an area. It would depend. Do you know what I mean? But it was nice because it could kind of go through a couple times. It helped when there was a lot of stuff going through all at one time. Maybe somebody can use that tip. I don't know. Yeah. Um, and then I haven't tried this yet, but I see a lot of teachers that do it and it's something I'd like to do eventually in my life. Sorry, I couldn't scroll to my unmute. Okay, so um, high school storage. Um, I'm clearly a budget woman because everything I say is about how you can save money. Um, so in thinking about how like high school students, I I love all the ideas. And when I have the life skill students, I do the thing with the trays and you put your piece on it and I wrap it all up. But for high school students, I'm not wrapping their stuff up for them. They have to do that themselves. One thing I'm obsessed with is dry cleaning bags. They are so big and you cannot poke them. Like some people bring in like target bags, those don't work, but dry cleaning bags, they fit over every single project. And then I have them Sharpie their name all over the dry cleaning bags. And I also love like styrofoam trays that you get from like the grocery store, you know, that like your grapes or your fish is on um, because it gives it kind of a sturdy base. So they put their pieces onto that styrofoam tray and they wrap it all up in the dry cleaning bags. And it has been really effective um keeps work pretty organized things don't dry out and again it's free and it's easy to replace as things get you know dirty or, and lost um so for our ceramics classroom we emptied out basically every cupboard <laughs> so that we could have uh project storage that was behind closed doors because i don't know what it is about clay in a bag but students just want to poke it <laughs> They know what's under there. They know what it feels like, but they just still feel like they need to poke it. Um, and then something else that we've done this year uh, is we um, got this wire rack. It was actually donated to us um, for drying work. And it has been a real game changer um, because we didn't have the beautiful slatted shelves like uh, Jess just showed from her picture in her classroom. Um, so before we got this wire rack donated to us, I was actually using cookie cooking coolie racks uh, that were um, for free on my local buy nothing group. So you could consider that too for drying questionably thick projects. Guys, I'm gonna jump in for a second because we have Adrian Justice on and she is from the Clay Studio in Philadelphia and they have a mobile outreach and she had a really good idea about the names. So I'm just gonna let her unmute herself for a minute and talk in case anybody missed it in the chat. Yeah, thanks, Holly. Um, yeah, my name's Adrian. I'm uh, the community engagement manager at the Clay Studio. So I manage the Claymobile program currently, um, but I never cross paths with you, Becky. So it's nice to meet you. Um, so we, we label work a number of different ways and some of them are really effective. And we've I definitely also, we've had our share of nightmares of um, mixed up work. So it happens. But um, one thing that we do do if if the class or the situation permits is we bring a set of stamps and they're just like those little like they're like quarter inch almost like they're really small or half inch square stamps and each one has a different picture on it so like there'll be like an apple and a chicken like just random pictures and we make a chart with the kids um names the class roster and we put the stamp um next to their names and then that is their stamp um every time they're with us so this doesn't work for us in every occasion but um it might work very well in a classroom because for Claymobile we're carrying the work back and forth to our studio so in in a classroom I could see that working even a little easier you just have your class rosters and you have your sets of stamps and then you know that that's that kid's image every 
every time and they can, and then you don't have to worry about the, um, not being able to read their names on the work. That's smart. Thanks, Adrian. And nice to meet you. I think you we've too. met each other. Yeah. <laughs> I was done in the early 2000s. So I think <laughs> I missed you. Yeah. yeah. Thanks so much for sharing that. I actually, that made me think that I have some old stamps that I have had brought home from mm -hmm. uh actually I think the trailer that had like things hoarded in it <laughs> mm -hmm. I and I need to look through those because I might yeah. be able to come up with something from some of those um I just put the, this slide on of suggestions for drying work in in the elementary classroom um I I try to, I don't like to, some teachers I know like to do like all of their clay, like the whole school in one week. And I can't even imagine, I don't, as an elementary teacher, I like to spread it out throughout the year and like maybe do a grade or two at a time. And even when I spread it out, I still am like finding every little spot I can find in my classroom. And I have, I have actually my storage closet, I have moved so much stuff out of my storage closet and store it and have found like cabinets to put it into out in my classroom so that I can use the shelves in my storage closet for clay. Um, and I also hoard carts. Some of the teachers in my school make fun of me for the number of carts I have in my room, but they're so useful for so many things and especially clay. And I also use every windowsill um, and countertop. So everywhere I can find to put clay for it to dry, um, I use. I think someone had said they would jump in and do this slide, I thought. I, yeah, I didn't know somebody else. I was the one that went ahead and just oh. put a bunch of stuff on there just to kind of help. I don't know if we necessarily need to read it all off, but it's just some stuff that will be in the slideshow um, when we send this out to people later. But it was just some basic things that I was thinking of about you know, when to put it in, you know, when it's actually ready, you know, just generally being safe with the fumes and making sure you're vented and, you know, don't leave your kin, you know, your kiln unattended and know your cone number. So I don't know if we necessarily need to read all this off, but it's definitely some kiln basics that are good for everybody to read once the slideshow comes out. And same for the general maintenance. I added some of this stuff too. You know, just you know, pay attention to your kiln, especially if you're not used to it. Um, if you have any large cracks, they can be sealed, but you do want to pay attention to that because they are going to slow you down. You know, make sure you are removing um, drips. You know, keep a, a log so that you know approximately how long your kiln is taking to fire. Because if all of a sudden it starts taking a really, really long time you know, you might have some, you know, general, you know, things to check out if it's not, um, you know, working out the way, you know, you, and just, you know, again, if you are trying to troubleshoot, don't stare at the hot elements because you can damage your eyes. But again, those things can be um, read with a little bit more, um, you know, clarification once you uh, get the slideshow. Yes, I'll, uh, I'll do that too. You can read this later. <laughs> Can I throw in one tip? Um, when you're thinking about kiln maintenance, a really overlooked thing I think is um, going through your elements with a, um, a shop vac and getting all those little dust pieces out because replacing elements isn't easy and it isn't cheap. And if you have like something explode and some little piece gets in there that you don't see, it's gonna just burn out your elements. So just running a shop vac through the elements is a really good way to just make sure that everything's gonna continue to run well for you. I'm going to follow suit here with this slide and, and as Jill said, just at your leisure.
Um, so I put in a little tidbit about taking care of your kiln shelves, because that seems to be what I do a lot of time. <laughs> I spend a lot of time doing uh, kiln shelf maintenance. Um, so our practice is to sponge the bottom as well as a very thin border around the bottom of the projects to present, prevent them from sticking. Um, I do not fire projects with dirty bottoms. They will stay on the shelf with a note that says wipe your bottom <laughs> until the bottom is wiped. Um, we don't use wax at our school. I know some people do. Um, and any, any project I find questionable, I will stilt that. And that's what those little images are to the right. Um, and what we do taking care of our kiln shelves is a lot of chiseling, a lot of wire brushing. And when you are doing this, you should be wearing an N95 mask. Also, one more tip. I found out the hard way last year, if the project is super heavy, like I had some students make 12 inch projects, those metal still, they melted down because it was so heavy the second time. So I was still everything just because I'm a psycho, but the other ones that are just all of the, it looks like just all the same material, use those for heavy projects. Oh, that's a good tip. Um, and then I inherited a lot of dirty um, stilts, so I was able to just run them down to the shop classes and grind down all of that mess with a belt sander. Oh, geez, this is still my slide. Oh, my gosh, I'm sorry, guys. Um, so if you have a, if you have a ceramic company in your local area, like we are fortunate enough to do with standard, um, or if you're savvy enough to do this yourself, we used cones and a cone sitter um, for many, many years. Um, but I, we were finding that we were getting some errors uh, with inaccurate temperature readings, power failures. So we just went ahead and had standard come out and install a thermocouple for us. And it has, um, it has made a world of difference for us. And then uh, like somebody added here to the bottom of the slide that they are pretty easy to replace yourself. Um, okay, still me. I guess I didn't realize how many thingies I put in here. Okay, so um, something that I know if you are a beginning um, ceramics teacher, uh, I just had a former student who is now currently an art teacher herself um, panic call me <laughs> because she didn't know what kind of clay to order. She didn't know what kind of glaze to order. She didn't know what cone she could fire to. Um, she didn't know what she currently had versus what she was going to be getting. Um, so I would just recommend uh, familiarizing yourself with the cone firings. Um, whether you're using a thermocouple or a cone sitter, it doesn't matter. You still need to know um, what temperature your clay and glazes are firing to. Um, so I just keep this handy dandy chart right next to the kitchen. Um, and it's been really helpful, especially when explaining it to students too. Sorry, that wasn't supposed to be a, an extra slide, but Scott gives these awesome posters out of conferences and it has all that stuff and it's really good references for the kids. But that wasn't supposed to be its own slide. Sorry about that. I think I wrote this one. Uh, hold on to your kiln manual. A lot of us are ending up with at the school I'm at presently. We just got a brand new kiln and um, the manufacturer gives you a manual. Then it's pretty important to keep it. It's very important to do the test firing before you fire your kiln with work in it for the first time. And if you are um, inheriting an older kiln, also important to always test fire first at least once to see how it goes. Me again. Um, this is about bisque firing, um, talking about the stage of bone dry clay and just some tips and thoughts there. Becky, I think you're muted. Thank you. This is a, a list of repairs for wet work or bone dry or glazed or cold finished work. Um, and this all stems back, Adrian, from Claymobile days. So um, glazed work, we always used to use a two part epoxy. I find that this is the best way to, you know, put something back on quickly that is, you know, a, a handle to a mug or whatever, something that's finished. 
Um, there's some directions there. Um, the bone dry clay, the slurry paper mixture, we actually, some of the text from the Claymobile came up with that, um, how to make that. And it's a pretty interesting little substance. There are things out there that you can buy that are repair, clay repair things at ceramic supply stores. Um, I never had a lot of success with those. And then wet work, there's a description there about band-aids that you can read at your leisure. So underglaze is, I, I still, I like to do just what we did in Claymobile, which was the color came from the underglaze and we just used clear glaze over top. I think that's, I probably should have labeled that as like an elementary ed suggestion. Um, it's affordable and you don't have quite as many mishaps. Um, everything's got a lot more control to it when you're using the underglaze rather than trying to like paint with glaze. I don't actually know. Um, I'm, I don't have a lot of experience using commercial glazes that aren't just under glaze and clear glaze. So there's some um, suggestions in there. And I think I put a YouTube video following this slide which we do not have to watch, just a suggestion if anybody's looking for some ideas. I think we can go to the next slide. Is this me? Yes, so for elementary school, not only do I recommend using like Amico under glazes to be more painterly to get color, um, these are the two low fire glazes that I like to use. Both of them have a lot of success. Um, they don't run very much and they, even without a really good thick coat will be nice and shiny for you. My goodness, I have another one. Um, this is just explaining a little bit more about glaze. The picture over there on the left is a pot that has underglaze with a nice shiny clear glaze over top. So that's what you can aspire to. All right, so this was my glaze organization when I taught elementary school for 11 years, and it worked really well. Um, I had somehow inherited 50 different glazes, so I made test tiles. I went to Lowe's. I asked them to cut a board that I found that was kind of cheap into the size I wanted, and I made boards based by color of the rainbow, and I numbered them that way too. So I also had um, the containers that you see at the bottom that they were labeled one through 19 and then 20 through whatever. So the kids would look at the board, find the color, take the color from the bin and then go to that color table. So I had six tables, one color was every color of the rainbow. So they knew if they couldn't find the glaze in the bin that it was at the table. And I always had them have the number face up. So that always helped. So they just correlated the number to the glaze that they saw since some of them are pink and purple and orange and they're not actually the right color. So it worked out really well. That's really smart, Crystal. Um, for teachers that are just starting out, if you don't have your test tiles made yet, um, something you can do is just keep your catalog handy dandy and then students can reference that for colors until you have time to make your test tiles. So I, um, on my first, my very first slide, I actually had this just little tidbit last year was the first that I have used glaze with students in 20 years because I took some time off when I had my kids. And, uh, and then when I came back, I um, was teaching in a trailer without a sink. Um, so I refused to use glaze at that point. I was like, I'm only firing once. Um, and so I will, we have other slides about uh, ways of not glazing projects. But um, so what I did last year and it worked great was I, I have my tables labeled by rainbow colors. So I put, color like a color at each table that was similar to the table color and then I used a couple of extra like I used our sculpture center table and our painting center table so I did add a couple of other uh, tables into the mix I limited how many students were allowed at each table I kept the brushes I put the brushes right in 
the glaze bottles and the brushes had to stay at the table and the students move with their um, clay piece from table to table. They do three layers. Um, the bottoms must be cleaned and I um, have I have them go to the sink and I have sponges next to the sink for them to wipe the bottom of their clay piece. But I, of course, check everything after afterwards before I fire it. Um, I think that's the important stuff. It worked out really well. So high school is, um, I actually find glazing to be the most fun thing about teaching high school ceramics and the hardest thing about teaching high school ceramics. By the way, tip for high school teachers, they can't help but shake the bottle of glaze, which is great, mix up the glaze, right? But you know there's always going to be that one kid that doesn't put the lid on correctly and somebody goes to shake the glaze and everybody gets gla glaze rain upon them. It happens at least once a year, even though like I sing and dance about it at the beginning of the year. So just a little tip there. Um, so I, I love the potter's choice for our cone six glazes, uh, cone five, six glazes. Um, you can't mess up the potter's choice glazes. Um, and they're so fun because they look so different. It's like you really do have that like Christmas moment um, when you're unloading the kiln because you're you're layering in different ways and you're applying different coats and you might be splashing it on. So it's so exciting. I make this as a really important thing to do with high school students, make them take extensive glaze notes. I have them put on a little piece of paper how many layers of Tenmoku over top of how many layers of lustrous jade. So when it comes out of the kiln and somebody's like, oh, that's beautiful, I wanna do that. They remember, they don't remember. They say they're gonna remember, but they're not gonna remember. So you have to make them write it down. They absolutely have to write it down. Now with the Potter's Choice, um, you can layer the glazes, but you can't mix the glazes. And that's something hard to get them to understand. Like that's that shift of thinking that they can't stir glazes together. Also, you know, when you look at the bottom, Bottle of blue root teal and it's a bright red and it's going to come out blue that's a learning curve too that things like these oh these look so dusty and ugly um, and then they come out you know shiny and beautiful and, and vibrant so it you know it's a lot and I did say earlier that I use a lot of different clay bodies in my classroom, which means I also have a section of low fire glazes and a section of mid fire glazes and let me tell you my little angels it, I, I could put them in different classrooms and I think they're still probably going to try to mix them. Um, so you have to like really dig that into their heads, which glaze goes with which temperature if you're like me and you're crazy enough to use different clay bodies in your classroom. But if you just want a really good, you can't mess this up, no matter what you put on it, it's going to have good results. The Potter's Choice glazes are a really good way to start off your high school ceramics program. Adrian, would you like to jump in for a second too with some glazing information? Yeah, sure. Um, so there's a couple things Claymobile does that um, nobody tells you you can do. So I like to uh, like to drop those truth bombs. So here's the thing: we actually once fire our work for Claymobile, we do not bisque fire our work. So what we do is we um, usually have the kids paint their work with underglaze and then we bring it back to our studio and we let it dry. And when it gets mostly bone dry, we put clear glaze over it and then we fire it. We fire it with a 12 hour candle on our kiln. So it's like just heating at a low temperature for 12 hours. So it'll dry it completely out in the kiln. And what this does for us is it saves us time and it saves us um, energy of the staff, basically. And we, um, I think in my time at the, at the Claymobile, I've only had a piece break in the kiln and cause a mess one time. So uh, cone 03, thanks, Crystal. Um, we fire everything to cone 03. Um, we, we use two low fire clays. We use um, standard 104 and 105. Um, so I know like a lot of times I, I tell uh, teachers this and it goes against, you know, what you've been told the rules are. Um, but there's um, there there just are other other ways to do things. Um, and it is OK to once fire work. It saves, you know, it saves 
energy too, um, in terms of electricity too. Um, so yeah, so I, I also wanted to say that we do once fairing also with clear, with um, gloss glazes. And I put in the chat, we use Duncan Stroke and Coat, or we used to use Teacher's Choice, which um, Kathy told us is now um, Teacher's Palette from Amico. And those are really great because you can, um, like the colors can mix. And so if you wanted, like, say you wanted to buy the gallon of red and the gallon of white in either of those brands of glaze, you can actually just pour the white and the red into a container and just shake it up and get pink. Um, and we do that sometimes like for Valentine's day, if we're doing heart projects, like we will make our pink, you know, and sometimes we make green and orange too, depending on like how, um, you know, supply chain stuff right now has been hard. So we've had to kind of get creative. And with those two brands of glaze, um, you can, yeah, you can, you can do that. Um, yeah. So yeah, if <laughs> avoid single firing, um, true, I would say just experiment on your own. If you can, I single fire all of my own work. I don't mean to push it because I it's not generally considered best practice, but it is how our program can run because we work with 3,500 students and that is the time that we have and it works. Um, yeah, so otherwise, um, I think that's all I have to say about glaze and firing. Thank you, Holly. Thank you. Um, I just wanted to jump in and say we're at 821. <laughs> And um, I know we have we have many more slides. Um, does anyone else from the panel um, want to give me an opinion? Um, I can't, we we had really been aiming to have time for a little some time for discussion and questions. Um, do, uh, I mean, I think Liza, I think it's a good idea to stop and do the questions because okay, everybody that's... can look at the rest of the slides. Yeah. Be, that's what I'm thinking. Yes. The remainder of the slides, we will be sharing the slideshow with you. And please feel free to, to reach out to us. But um, how about, does anybody have a question they want to jump in with? Or um, I, oh, and I did one thing that I want to make sure I mention, there was one person who sent me and I'm sorry, I meant to look up the name. It, um, it was a person who said that the lid of their kiln was cracked. And if if that person is here, I, I am going to send you an email. <laughs> Hi, Angela. I can, um, I had shared that question with um, all of our panel um, and, and uh, I did get responses from everyone. Um, and I can send you those responses or, um, or if you just want to, Angela, if you just want to talk now um, and start us off, <laughs> that works too. I can do either way. Okay. Um, so I'm trying to, you said it's like cracking your, the lid of your kiln. Yep. <laughs> yeah. I yeah. truthfully, truthfully, none of us had like this brilliant answer. Um, other than to just reach out to uh, someone had said local artists um, maybe might know. I think Jill had mentioned that um, what is it called the the kiln isn't there kiln cement? Yeah, depending on how big the crack is, sometimes you can patch them with kiln cement and that at least get you through for a while. Um, if it's just the lid, it, you might even be able to call the manufacturer instead of replacing an entire kiln, just maybe replacing just the lid. Um, sometimes that's possible too. Um, after Liza sent out that question, I was kind of getting on and looking for um, places that I know you said you're sort of in rural Potter County, which is very up north. Um, there doesn't, most of the kiln repair places that I was coming up with tended to be more around Philadelphia and Pittsburgh, but however, there is some that are in Southern New York. So you might even be able to find somebody that can venture down from Southern New York up down into um, Northern Pennsylvania. I'll try that. Thank you. I know I, I broke a, a kiln lid one time. A kid put a big sculpture on top of it to dry and, um, I, I, it was a scut kiln and I just ordered a new lid. Um, I, 
Yvonne um, was asking if she can put kiln wash on the bottom of the kiln because she has a thing crap. That's what that's what I was thinking. Um, Jill, why is that exact? Do you exactly? I mean, kiln wash is really just for the top size of your shelves. Just that way, if you get a drip that you can kind of get your work off easy, you don't want to do it on the underside of your shelves because it can flake off and drip into the work while it's getting fired. And you really don't want to put that anywhere on the kiln itself. It's just because of the chips and the maintenance and it getting in your work. Any other questions or suggestion, great suggestions that you, for things that work for you? I, I thought of something else that I did actually come here intending to share. It's um, when it has to do with when kids are using underglaze or glaze, we don't want them to mix our colors. Um, uh, you know, accidentally with their paintbrush, like putting it in the red, then sticking it in the green and stuff like that. Um, so what we do is instead of giving each child a paintbrush, we give each color a paintbrush and we'll set a plate, like a tray of glaze and small cups. And we put a one paintbrush with each color and the teachers often will like dip it in the paintbrush. I mean, dip the paintbrush in the glaze and then just make a little mark on the piece of um, butcher paper that it's sitting on. So the kids know, you know, so they, they always know to to stick, keep that paintbrush with that glaze. And then they just work on waiting their turn and, and sharing and things like that. Um, I'm just looking because I know I saw another question. Oh, uh, someone asked about recycling techniques. Stacy asked about recycling tech. What are your best recycling techniques? And um, I just posted a video too on that. Okay, great. Thank you very much. That's, we've been having problems with clay that was left over from COVID trying to recycle it out so we don't lose it. I'm trying to look through and see. I would love for somebody to address the question asking about the fear of getting started with this. Oh, you, I was just, oh, sorry. Could Go you ahead. maybe elaborate on what grade level you're at and like what your teaching scenario looks like? I think that question came from Sarah. Thank you. Um, I'm with pre-K three through fourth grade, so it feels very daunting to even begin. <laughs> I just, um, I tried clay with fourth grade last year, and it went okay-ish, um, but working with the littler ones, um, you know, it, it seems a bit overwhelming to me to start just with all of the like keeping things clean aspect. You know, I, know. I, I would say, especially for like pre-K, um, you know, I've had some friends who just do like a little, like they just give them a little piece and then use something that they can press texture into it. And then you use like a straw to poke a hole in it. And then it's like a little, um, for a necklace. <laughs> like, a, like a medallion or something, yeah. right? Um, yeah. Sarah, if, oh, I'm sorry, Liza. No, I was just gonna say that, I mean, it's super simple, it's tiny, it's quick, and it gets them started on the process and it helps get you to feel more comfortable with it. So, you know, something really simple. That's a good idea. Thank you. 
Sure. Sarah, I was going to mention the same thing. I used to teach my son's preschool um, clay and they were two, three and four. And yeah, they just needed a teeny bit of clay. They liked, they loved sticking toothpicks into the clay and then I would remove them and fire it and it would have all the texture. And I have a little post on the repairs specifically for people teaching like you, where you have teeny tiny pieces that you can't scratch and attach that slurry of like paper towel napkin and slip you can just plop the little tiny pieces on and they might fire and you can preserve their little quirky things that they make so i i also with claymobile um we have a lot of experience with pre-k kids and we do approach it really really differently um one thing that we do is we use standard 910 air dry clay and we give them mixed media objects we give them i i have some pictures but i'm sure we're probably out of time um we give them like perler beads those beads that we used to like iron as a kid i don't know if you all did that we give them those and they stick them into the um standard 910 and also pipe cleaners and it's a it's really beautiful what they do um it really helps to be able to like open up the ceramic process with younger kids and have them just be in it for the sensory experience and also do what they're naturally inclined to do, which is put other objects into it, like just poke it, you know? So I, I like the air dry clay for that reason. And it dries and really does look like stoneware and it's really hard. Um, what did you say it was called again? The air dry clay that you use? It's by standard and it's 910, number 910. Okay, thank you. Karen has her hand up and, and then uh, also I see we're going past our yeah. time a bit. So. Well, I was just going to say that with, I mentioned it um, in the chat, but with kindergarten, something I do that was really special with them is I give them a really small piece of ball of clay and they experience it through all five senses, except obviously taste. And we make a really big deal. We gently touch it. We talk about what it feels like. And then they smell it. We talk about what it smells like and they listen to it. It's like really the best moment ever. You watch an entire classroom of five-year-olds put their ears to it and they talk about what it sounds like and they come up with these really great things. And then they gently put one hand on it and then another hand on it and flatten it. And then I give them like, I have shells and like, um, like Lego type of pieces and they just spend some time pressing into it. And I teach them, if you don't like what you see, then you smooth it, smooth it out. And so they just make texture. And like a number of people have said, and then as they're working, I go around with a straw and stick it in there and put their names on the back and collect it. And that takes a 45 minute period. And it's like, then no one gets very messy. They have this really incredible experience where they talk and experience it in a different way than other kids who are in a rush because other kids have this idea of what they want to make. These kids have no idea. So I just, it's worked really well and you can really do it with little kids. So that's, I just wanted to say that because we've all had our failures and that's something that worked. <laughs> so I thought it was important to share it. Thank you for letting me speak. I love that. <laughs> yeah. That's so fun. Um, so we are technically past our time. Um, so I think maybe what we could say, if there's anyone who really, really has like a pressing question that they still um, haven't had a chance to ask, um, I'd be happy to or if anyone else would be <laughs> happy to stay on and answer. But um, I do just want to really thank um, Holly and Jess and Becky and uh, Jill and who am I? Uh, Crystal and uh, Leah. <laughs> I'm trying to think of who am I forgetting? Um, Kathy and Adrian. Yeah. Oh, and Adrian and Kathy. Yes. Thank you for jumping on board with this. And I could not have, this couldn't have happened without um, everyone who joined together for this. And we have mentioned the, the division um, directors have said, um, we are, we think that we could do more things like this for the, for 
the divisions um, with all different uh, uh, things like printmaking or um, anything. <laughs> and so um, I, I hope we're still excited about that idea because I think we could run with that. But also we um, could do, we definitely can do more with clay. So, and I think maybe we should at some point. Um, uh, but thank you for being here. Um, I hope this was helpful. And even if you want to give us like suggestions for if we would do more about clay, um, what else you would find helpful? We thought thought something about having uh, some local artists, that, um, clay artists um, speak. But um, like I said, if there's anyone who still has a question, but thank you for being here if you uh, need to leave. And I'm just going to jump in because I've been reading some of the questions too. The okay. there will be a recording. Um, we're not going to send it out to you directly, but it will be on the um, PAEA website as soon as our webmaster can get that on there. We will make sure that when the Act 48 link comes out, most likely tomorrow, so we can get all this information. So we'll give you emails. We'll give you um, a copy of the slideshow. Um, I'll save a copy of the chat so that you can go back and revisit some of those questions as well. Um, and if all of the other panelists think of anything else we need to include in that Act 48 email, just send it my way. And then that way I can send that all out to everybody tomorrow. And I think Jess Alesso has a hand up. I do. I just wanted to do one last push or one push for our conference. It's still not too late yes. to register. Um, if people are interested, and I think I'm definitely going to take notes for next year um, about including a lot of clay uh, at, our, <laughs> at our Erie conference. So Thanks everybody. Feel free to email any of your board members, region reps, et cetera, about conference questions. Definitely. Anything else? Anybody has anything to share? All right, then I guess we're gonna call that a wrap. All of you that participated in getting this all set up, if there's anything you want me to send out to um, our participants, please send them to those to me in an email and I will get all that out tomorrow. So with that being said, everybody have a lovely evening. Thank you. Great job panel. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs>